we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the April Crop and Livestock Outlook. Uh, it's brought to you by MU Extension and the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute here at the University of Missouri. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a couple of different topics. Um, first of all, we've got some special topics, and you can guess what's up there at the top of the list with COVID-19. Um, and then we're going to go into, we're going to touch on uh, corn, wheat, and soybeans. And David's going to take us through some of the, the technical trading and what to do if uh, you've made that mistake like me and you still have some crop in the bin that really isn't priced. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so some of us have to learn the hard way. Um, and then we've got <laughs> livestock outlook out there uh, that, that Scott's going to take us through and explain all of the craziness in the markets. Uh, so I'm glad he's, he's doing that one. Um, the, uh, so wanted to let you know, we did have a series of grain marketing workshops that got uh, uh, um, sort of interrupted. We only had the first five done and then we, we, we got shut down uh, due to COVID-19. But what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be putting some videos on the grain mar marketing website and that's gonna go up under uh, fapri.missouri.edu, Farmer's Corner. And uh, so you'll be able to see some of what we talked about in those, in those different meetings. I'm, I'm sure you don't want to watch four hours of videos, but we're going to try to do some short clips and take you through some things that, and maybe do it topic by topic. So if there's some things you're interested in, you can see them and some that you're not, um, you don't have to watch those. Um, and so the other thing we're doing is we're trying to get a system together that will automatically pull the uh, basis data for Missouri terminals and maybe some of the surrounding states for some of you who live on the on the edge of the state and uh, have something just across the border that you market to. So the idea being that you can see what your local basis is and that it's updated on a regular basis uh, um, and can be um, uh, can be an asset for you in terms of how you're marketing your grain. So a couple of things that are going on in the background. Hopefully we'll get those up here in the not too distant future. Um, the, uh, our next uh, slide here goes into some of the special topics. And this is where I was gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19. You've seen and heard a lot of stuff about this. I don't wanna wear anybody out with it. With this particular slide, what I was, the, the main point of this is to kind of illustrate, but don't worry about the words on here. It's more to, to illustrate what, the, what, what they're talking about out there when they're saying, they're talking about trying to do social distancing to, distancing to flatten the curve. What they mean is they're watching this, uh, this, this first uh, scenario they ran was a case isolation only scenario where each individual COVID case would just be individually isolated. They wouldn't do anything, no social distancing. And the concern was, you can see this big spike up here. And the concern was that that was what uh, would lead to overwhelming uh, our hospitals. And so the idea was with social distancing to flatten that curve. And so you can see it here uh, with, this, with this green uh, curve. And that's, that's what they, th they believe they've accomplished. Um, the, the, the problem is, or what they're worried about, is if we reintroduce um, or, or go back to normal too quickly, we get the risk of a resurgence. And what would happen is, or where this would probably fall in the timeline is somewhere in this fall, perhaps, uh, you know, somewhere in that October, November timeline would be the, the, the timeline we might get a resurgence if we're back into interacting. And that is what they were, what they've been trying to debate as to how could we avoid that, uh, that second, that second surge of infections. And so, um, that is, this is kind of the concept of what they're talking about. And so you can see the number of months here at the bottom, you know, one, one of these, which is like a six month type of uh, scenario where the other is even, I've even seen longer ones that go out 12 to 18 months. So um, this, is, this is really what is the uncertainty about how quickly uh, we, can, we can eliminate the social distancing. And so that's what that graph is trying to explain. I normally don't talk a lot about other topics uh, in agriculture, but this is, affects ag directly because it, tell, it gives us some sense for how long and what are the factors that could influence how long this goes on. Um, so, so what are we seeing out there? What, what are we seeing in direct ag impacts? Well, first, of course, it, it started with the closure of the 
you know, the dine-in portions of restaurants. So restaurants still doing a lot of carry out, but for the most of the part of them, the most of the estimates I've seen from different studies show about 60 to 70% decline in restaurant uh, revenues. Um, and some of them are even higher than that. But it's, um, so consumers have as a result switched to grocery stores, which would be the natural, uh, a natural thing you would think would happen. And of course they were advised early on to try to get two weeks of food supply on hand at home. And as they did that, you know, there were certain products that they were looking for. Uh, they were looking for basic staples, flour, rice, pasta, breakfast cereals, and uh, some of the easy to cook meats, um, you know, things like hamburger and, uh, and that type of thing. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's really interesting uh, when you go through the grocery store to see what items were picked. But a lot of times, uh, in fact, the grocery stores initially reported trouble with having the, the produce wasn't moving, the fresh produce, because um, a lot of folks looked at that as not having a long shelf life. And so this, the, the pa pattern of buying was really interesting. Um, and so the other problem was, of course, that when you switch from restaurants to grocery store, the, the cuts of meat are different. And so that was one of the big hangups in terms of the, the whole packaging aspect. Remember that a lot of times when they're taking things to restaurants, they're in much larger packages. You know, you might have a 20 pound package of shredded cheddar cheese. Well, the most typical consumers won't buy that much, uh, that much cheddar cheese at one time. And so then they had to figure out how can we get this into smaller packages and ramp up that part of the, the production uh, stream versus, uh, you know, filling these 20 pound packages. So, so examples like that are just some of the little things that uh, kind of create glitches. The other thing, of course, is logistically, and this isn't, isn't perhaps as onerous as the other, as repackaging, but just rerouting trucks and, and, and taking the equipment to the right places and, and getting the right scale of things uh, all takes a lot of shifting around and it happened in a very, very short period of time. Um, the other issue is, of course, most grocery stores no longer retain a butcher on staff. So, you know, utilizing what, you know, a restaurant might got, might have gotten as a big, large, you know, uh, uh, chunk of carcass, you know, to, that, that they could then process into or cut steaks out of or whatever, um, you now have to, in the grocery store, they can't handle those because they don't have any Body that can actually transform that into something the consumer wants to wants to buy, and so that's that was another problem that created an issue on the livestock side. Um, the commercial fruit and vegetable producers have actually had enough problem uh, finding getting their their product rerouted to grocery stores from restaurants that they've actually begun feeding some of those crops to um, to, to to livestock, and so I can tell you that, for example, strawberries in uh, Florida, curiously enough, did get fed, some of those got fed to livestock. So there are some very interesting things that have happened that we found out about the supply chain as we've gone through this. You, you, I'm sure you've all, and maybe hopefully nobody's experienced this, but you know, milk has begun to be dumped both here in the United States as well as Canada and other areas, simply because you know, there's lots of issues with trying to get milk processed, getting it getting uh, uh, cheese and other products back into the right size packages uh, for consumers to get at grocery stores. This has just created a lot, a lot of chaos. And then you have things like the grocery stores feeling like they can't get enough supply of milk in gallons or half gallons. Uh, and so they've imposed consumer purchase limits um, at the same time. So just a lot of disruption with this. Um, one of the things in terms of the costs that are happening in the, in the system, um, almost, you know, every uh, worker that I've talked to throughout the chain has said, look, we're, we're you know, we're, we see this as a hazardous situation to be in. We're looking for incentives in, the, in terms of bonuses or higher rates per hour. And in fact, most, many of the uh, companies that are, whether they're doing meat packing or if you've got uh, packing groceries at the grocery store, or stocking shelves, or um, uh, even even truck drivers getting uh, bonuses for um, staying, um, st you know, incentivizing workers to show up and be at work and 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 keep the the food supply chain open. 
Um, <clears throat> there have been a few examples of some processing plants where we're, there were walkouts due to concerns over safety aspects because they do work very, very closely with one another. Um, and then we have, of course, the, the outbreaks now have begun to affect livestock slaughter facilities and that's resulting in plant closures. So the other thing I was gonna mention was cotton demand is beginning to collapse. Uh, this is from the International Cotton Council. Um, and they are saying that the brands and retailers are canceling orders with spinners and textile manufacturers. That's not a good sign for cotton demand longer term. And um, as we look also some countries, now this is perhaps a little positive for the US, but some countries are beginning to stockpile food. And you see it particularly in rice and wheat. Um, and so this is why rice and wheat prices may move counter to the directions that corn and soybeans have been heading. So some things to keep in mind there. Um, the other thing I was gonna mention was the whole impact on biofuels. This has been largely a, a demand impact uh, because biofuels, even though they have a volume obligation, they're, they're actually technically that volume obligation is enforced through a blend, uh, blend percentage. And so um, when, when the total consumption of gasoline or diesel declines, the whole demand for uh, ethanol and biodiesel declines at the same time. And we've seen that show up in our, uh, in our corn price here. Um, and so it's, it's become a, a very serious issue for, for the biofuels producers. And we've got a number of ethanol plants that have shut down. Um, so if we summarize that in terms of negative impacts and positive impacts, you know, you can see cotton, corn, biofuels, soybeans, beef demand, both from the disruption in the supply chain, but also the recession impact, it's very sensitive to, to income levels. And, uh, you know, we can all remember the, the 2008 Great Recession. Um, and so it's, it's, it is going to have an impact on beef demand. How big of an impact it has depends upon how quickly we recover from this particular um, uh, COVID-19. And of course, pork demand has much of the same issues um, already seeing impacts on uh, bacon demand, uh, pork bellies, um, and then on the positive impact side, what is interesting is you s typically see this is within a recession, a lot of increase in egg demand is a very uh, inexpensive uh, source of protein as well as some increase in chicken demand. Um, and then you see rice demand curiously being very up as very much uh, are, are, are being stronger simply because people purchasing that as a staple plus the international uh, uh, occurrences of different countries actually restricting exports or outright uh, stopping exports. Um, so causing sort of a, a little bit of a, a, a demand surge internationally as place, people, other countries try to figure out where am I going to buy my rice from if, if I can't get it from uh, India or Thailand or some, someplace else. And then wheat demand, I think that's a little bit uncertain. It has been stronger recently. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens longer term. But again, it's kind of a staple. One of the things that happened uh, just last week was the Russians uh, coming out and saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to limit, we're going to put an export limit on in terms of quantity for wheat. So you can't just, you know, uh, we won't be exporting just uh, in, in a completely open market. So with that, I'm going to switch over to Marty. Uh, and let him give you the corn outlook. Hey, thanks, John. If I can get the slide to move. Well, I'm not having any luck moving the slide, John, so. I guess you're going to have to move it for me. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the corn outlook and wanted to start out with the, uh, the supply and demand. Uh, so uh, USDA, uh, you know, in contrast to the uh, March update, which saw very few changes, we saw a lot more significant changes on the uh, balance sheet for corn uh, this month. So, uh, you know, no changes in the supply side or on the production, at least. Uh, they did lower the uh, imports by uh, 5 million uh, bushels. 
Uh, but most of the excitement was on the uh, demand side uh, there. And you can see, first of all, the uh, feed residual there uh, under the 1920 column, that red circle. So they revised feed and residual up 150 million bushels uh, from last month to 5.675 billion. So uh, a pretty hefty increase there. That was pretty much telegraphed, at least some kind of an increase was telegraphed based on the, uh, on the March 1 uh, stocks estimate uh, that we had back at the end of March. So we, we did expect to see some kind of a revision there. Uh, maybe uh, a little more aggressive than maybe the trade was even expecting there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, the ethanol, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of focus on the uh, ethanol uh, forecast, the corn for ethanol forecast, and some are anticipating maybe a little more of a, a gradual uh, cut there. Uh, USDA uh, were a little bolder uh, move and uh, cut 375 million uh, out of the. Uh, the corn for ethanol uh, forecast. So, uh, you know, all in all, we netted out uh, about a 200 million, uh, just a little over 200 million bushel uh, cut in the uh, in the total use. Uh, that fell through to uh, mostly to ending stocks. Uh, to ending stocks up 200 million bushels from uh, from last month to almost 2.1 billion. That was a little higher than the uh, trade was expecting. Uh, not a lot, but uh, 50, 60 million more than the trade was anticipating. So uh, the supply demand balance on corn technically looked a little bit negative, uh, although the market didn't really respond all that, uh, all that poorly to it. Um, one thing we did see on the, uh, uh, on the price, USDA lowered their uh, uh, forecast price by 20 cents a bushel to 360. Uh, that's a pretty large revision down, considering the fact that we're you know, halfway through the marketing year, and in terms of that weighted average, we're probably more like two thirds of the way through in terms of the weightings on how that uh, how that season average is calculated. So, uh, a pretty aggressive cut uh, there, and clearly, uh, you know, anticipating uh, what well, we saw the market, you know, all the weakness that we've seen in the market, and uh, uh, based on their forecast, they're. Uh, you know, not leaning too bullish on the uh, on the corn price outlook. Uh, shifting just to the next column over there, the 2021, uh, we've got the planted area in there at 92.6. Now, uh, this is a factory's number. This is, I believe, prior to the prospective plantings uh, that came out at the end of March. So, USDA's uh, prospective plantings came in at uh, essentially 97 uh, million acres. So. Uh, well above the uh, factory forecast. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second too, but uh, I think most are expecting that that number will probably come in, uh, wind up being a little less than 97 uh, million. Uh, trend yield at, at 176, and you go down through there and uh, look at the, uh, the ending stocks forecast uh, down around uh, 2.4, so a pretty hefty uh, increase from, from this year. You know, I've seen some private forecasts you know, all the way up, looking at ending stocks, well over three billion bushels, though. Uh, pretty bearish, uh, pretty bearish number if if that uh, if that uh, you know comes to fruition. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the uh, uh, corn export sales. Uh, I guess some a little bit of a bright spot there in in terms of uh, exports. You know, we've had these meetings. I've complained about how. How poor uh, you know corn exports have performed, but they actually have picked up here of late. In fact, last week's export sales was a marketing year high, uh, for about 73 million uh, bushels last week. So we've kind of turned a bit of a corner here over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, so we're we're picking up. It's kind of uh, what we need to see if we have a chance for the exports to uh, reach uh, USDA's uh, forecast for the marketing year. Now they didn't revise the export forecast uh, this time. I think largely due to the fact that uh, we have had a stronger, uh, you know, export sales uh, book here of late. Um, you know, Brazil's uh, kind of out of the market now, so we have a chance here to do some good with uh, corn exports over the next, you know, a couple of months at least until they begin harvesting uh, that uh, crop, uh, their, their uh, second crop down there in uh, Mato Grosso. Uh, we're still though running well behind uh, where we were a year ago. I think we're. Uh, over 400 million bushels below uh, last year, uh, in terms of uh, you know where we are versus total commitment uh, compared to the to, to USDA's forecast, 
Uh, I think we're uh, low 70s, 72, 3% of the, of the forecast. Uh, normally, we'd be more like about 80%. Uh, maybe seeing these, things, these numbers skew a little bit just because of uh, Brazil's impact on uh, global, global trade. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, the corn feed and residual. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, bumped that up based on the stocks numbers. And so we're going to be about uh, the highest we've been in, in 12 years or so on uh, feed and residual for corn. So uh, a little bit of a, a positive there. We've seen uh, real strong feed and residual, not just based on the March 1 stocks, but the December 1 stocks uh, kind of signaled that as, uh, at, as well. So Essentially, you know, we're looking at uh, the implied feed use for the first half of the marketing year at a little over 70% of what USDA's forecast is for, for the entire marketing year. Uh, so with that upward revision, they, they move things pretty much in line with the historical uh, situation in terms of, you know, percent of uh, feed and residual use through the first half of the year. So on average, last 10 years or so, right around uh, 70, 71% usually is what your uh, feed use of the first half accounts for out of the total. Uh, you know, possible we could see some upper, further upward revisions. I just note on that graph how, uh, you know, how feed, uh, raw corn feeding went down uh, there from the mid 2000s to, you know, early, you know, 2013, 14, following the drought we began to recover. So a lot of that decline was just based on the fact that we were feeding uh, producing a lot more ethanol and DDGs, which uh, uh, substituted uh, in corn feeding, a raw corn feeding ration. Uh, next slide, uh, I wanted to shift a little bit to the ethanol situation. You can see some, we've got uh, ethanol production there is the black line. This is the weekly, uh, weekly uh, total production in millions of gallons. So you can see there how dramatic the decline has been. So it went from you know, 300, 320 million gallons per week of production down to below 200 uh, million gallons in the last reporting. So this would be uh, as of the end of uh, last week. So, uh, well, this would actually be through the first week of April, I guess. Uh, and at the same time, you've seen the decline in production, the stocks have ballooned as well. So we've seen the red line, the uh, weekly stocks total, you know, surge up to almost 1.15 uh, billion gallons. Um, on the back on the production side, that's the you know USDA's database doesn't go back all that far, but uh, you know, 10 years, uh, well, at least to 2000, uh, I guess 2010 or so, and uh, that's the lowest total that they have in their data set for weekly production. Uh, normally, you get a cut in production, the stocks would be flat or down, but not the case this time. A big surge in the uh, stocks as well. You know, the pipeline uh, is essentially getting, uh, getting full. Uh, next slide is uh, taking a look at uh, the weekly production compared to last year. Uh, and then, you know, we saw the decline uh, on the previous slide there. So that, uh, that pace, if you continued on at that pace, that's an annualized rate of uh, ethanol production is a little over 10 billion gallons. You know, normally we're running, you know, 16, 16 and a half, something like that. Uh, the green line there is just the, the weekly rate of uh, ethanol production you would need in order to uh, get uh, to achieve that the new level of uh, corn use for ethanol that USDA has plugged into the balance sheet now, that, that 5.05 billion number. So uh, even though they made a pretty big cut, you look at this graph, it uh, looks like we've got... Uh, you know, got to work cut out for us even to uh, to even reach that uh, you know five billion plus number that they've got on the balance sheet currently. Uh, next slide is the uh, DDG prices. So one of the other things that's occurred as a result of the big uh, decline in ethanol production is we're you know uh, tightening up the supply of DDG. So we've seen a little bit of a spike in uh, DDG prices here of late uh, as uh, as those supplies have. Uh, tightened up because of the uh, lower production. The red line there is a uh, USDA series uh, for Northern Missouri. It's uh, right around 180 a ton. That's actually one of the lower prices. If you look, you know, at some of the, compared to some of the other regions, I, I put in Western Iowa here just as a comparison. It's uh, uh, gone up a little more dramatically uh, about to, I think we're up to 192.50 on the average. 
you know, the high end of their price range, some of those ranges are pretty wide, but uh, see some of the, on the high end of the range, well over $200 a ton. So a big, uh, a big increase in the DDG uh, price. Looking at uh, ethanol, uh, this just shows you the uh, past several years of uh, corn use for ethanol. As I mentioned, or a little over uh, current forecast, a little over 5 billion uh, bushels of corn. So that puts us back, you know, toward uh, levels that we were looking at, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and it's probably at risk of being revised down a little bit further. Uh, next slide is the uh, funds position. I put that uh, in here just to show um, you know, where the where, what's the fund's net position. So that blue there that you see is their uh, net position. Uh, and this would be as of uh, last Tuesday. So they are looking, uh, holding a net position of about 110,000 contracts, net short about 110,000. Now this is a mod, what I would, I guess, classify as moderately net short, not, not an extreme. You know, not like they were, you know, back as spring last year when they were, you know, net short over 300,000 contracts. Uh, in, in fact, you probably could argue that the funds really haven't been, you know, sort of the aggressive sellers here on the, as, as prices have come down. Now, normally you see this kind of a price week that you'd expect the funds to probably be even a little more uh, aggressive and be, you know, uh, have a larger, as a net short position on than they do. Um, I guess I would also just point to the fact that if we do, uh, if we were to see some, a bit of a recovery for whatever reason in prices, you could trigger uh, the funds to come back out of this position. It would be a little bit supportive as they bought back that, that net short. Uh, next slide uh, to the uh, prospective planning. As I mentioned, uh, um, uh, prospective planning came in at 97 million. That's up eight. Uh, percent from uh, last year. Now, most of the trade, I think, believe that this number will wind up uh, probably two or three, maybe a million less than that. A lot, of, of course, will depend on the uh, the weather. Oh, you know, as we start uh, ramping up the planting uh, progress, uh, planting progress. In fact, uh, first uh, first planting progress will be out. Uh, report will be out this afternoon. The trades it's anticipating something like three or four uh, percent. Uh, planted nationally. So just uh, early stages of planning clearly. Um, the next slide, one of the, one of the reasons that uh, we're anticipating maybe a, a pullback in from 97 million is just the fact that this corn, soybean corn price ratio has made a pretty dramatic move, uh, you know, in the last, uh, you know, month or so where we've gone from, you know, kind of a neutral area down there around 2.3, uh, 2.4 up to a lot closer to 2.5 to 1. So when you get up uh, the two and a half to one or higher, it's uh, clearly, you know, favoring soybeans over corn. So uh, markets at least uh, signaling kind of here as we move into planting time that uh, uh, maybe farmer or trying to encourage farmers to maybe shift a little more uh, towards beans and a little less of a shift to corn. This is a slide on the, just the forward curve or you know, what's the carry look like in the uh, corn market. So we've got uh, February, March and April on here and you can see you know, how prices have clearly shifted down uh, pretty dramatically, you know, 40 cents, uh, 45 cents or so from back in February. Uh, at, at the same time that prices have come down, we put a little bit of a carry in the market, not too dramatic. We can see how the black line and the red are relatively flat. Now we've got a little more of an upward sloping uh, line on here. Uh, even so, it's, it's not, the uh, market's still not really signaling uh, you know, the farmers uh, to stores where the market's not paying uh, very, very well for storage. Uh, next slide, I wanted to uh, just cover the basis for a moment. I heard a lot about how the basis is weakened, uh, especially, you know, with these uh, ethanol plants shut down. So this is uh, Macon, Missouri, uh, with Poet plant there. And you can see the basis has uh, come off from about, you know, even with the futures to you know, 15, uh, 18 cents uh, under the futures. Uh, I guess I would point out though that, you know, the basis was extraordinarily or unusually strong prior to this. So we really moved basis back down towards more of a, a longer term average there. Uh, I'd also point to the fact that uh, the basis seasonally tends to be a little bit weak from now, you know, over the next uh, four, five, six weeks. So uh, could see some further pressure on the basis uh, going forward here, just, just on the seasonal. Uh, the next slide um, is New Madrid. So this is a, a river market. 
we can see, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the export market's been a lot firmer than uh, the interior uh, with the ethanol. So the exports have been relatively strong. So the basis has held up better along the river markets. Um, and on maybe, you know, maybe seasonally, there's a little more left in it, uh, but uh, probably getting uh, probably getting a little more risky. I think, you know, once you get past, uh, you know, say the mid to late May, you're probably, uh, you know, uh, you begin to see how crops are going to uh, unfold here for the new crop. Uh, things tend to taper off there uh, into the late summer. Uh, the next slide is just a uh, the May futures contract. You can see right now, uh, currently we're just trading in a little consolidation pattern down, down there right around uh, 330 or so. Uh, uh, the longer term, there's some support on the charts just below uh, this area right in here. Uh, once you go to the next slide, uh, David will cover a lot more on the technical side than I will, but I just wanted to point out where, you know, where we are historically here. So we're you know, moving down against that uh, support right around 325, 330 on the uh, nearby futures. Uh, if, if that gives way, we see closes below 325, there's really not much uh, support on the chart, at least in my view, until you get down to you know, right around three and then below three, there's uh, not much there. So I, I would think that uh, if we if we hold, uh, if we can hold 325, good. If we, if we can't, then uh, we could be looking at another, uh, you know, 20, 25 cent uh, down move to retest that longer term support from all the way back in, you know, 2010 or so. And then here a few years ago uh, when we tested that $3 area with, again. Next slide. Uh, just to sum up, so you know, John uh, covered this. You know, the ethanol industry is you know, clearly under a lot of pressure, and that's uh, one of the key drivers here in the, in the corn market. Uh, I guess a little positive note that we, we are seeing stronger exports and feed use. Uh, seasonally, the price uh, seasonal is a little bit uh, positive for corn, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, to me, technically, it's kind of a key whether the May can hold you know three twenty five and then below that three dollars. Uh, the new crop outlook uh, appears fairly negative to me, uh, you know, longer term, uh, and unless acreage, you know, comes in a lot, lot uh, well below, you know, what the prospective planning report uh, suggests. And then anything close to a trend yield, we're looking at a pretty big uh, ending stocks increase next year. Uh, so, you know, even though new crop prices are, you know, have come down a long way, I'm afraid they could uh, come down even further. Uh, Let's just uh, touch on the uh, wheat for a moment. Uh, stocks to use. So, you know, even though wheat prices have performed well globally, uh, we, we're, we don't have a wheat shortage. Uh, you know, wheat uh, stocks uh, are close to 40% stocks to use. Uh, some of the highest that we've seen in, in uh, modern history here. So uh, plenty of wheat uh, around the world globally. Uh, and USD actually nudged that number up a little bit uh, in the, uh, the WASD update this month. Uh, next slide is the uh, supply demand balance. So uh, made a few changes uh, uh, to wheat. Uh, feed residual, uh, they cut that back uh, 15 uh, million bushels. Uh, they in fact cut exports by 15 million bushels as well. So even though we've seen uh, you know wheat market respond fairly well, uh, you know I know some concern out there about you know uh, stockpiling and maybe some export restrictions. Uh, from uh, exporting countries. Uh, US, in terms of the US, USDA actually lowered the export forecast a little bit. And all that fell through to, uh, to ending stocks. So ending stocks got revised uh, uh, up 40 million to 970. Uh, although the uh, uh, season average price actually increased slightly from last month, I think five cents a bushel up to 460. Uh, over there on the uh, right hand column, uh, the 2021, it looks like we're, you know, uh, with perspective planning's uh, actually down a little bit below that, uh, 45, uh, 44.7. Uh, so that would be using USDA's, uh, you know, surveyed estimate for winter wheat uh, combined with the perspective plannings for the other spring in Durham uh, to come up with that uh, total. So they're uh, forecasting a slight reduction in, uh, in acreage, but uh, pretty small. And then with, uh, with an average yield and a little bit of a recovery, um, uh, I guess actually demand is down a little bit uh, based on this forecast. 
uh, we would have uh, stocks uh, declining a little bit, 100 million bushels roughly from uh, from last year. So most balance sheets I've seen are looking for a, a, a reduction in ending stocks uh, uh, in 2021 versus this year, but, uh, but we don't really uh, pull stocks down to what I would consider to be a tight uh, level. Uh, a little bit, of, then with the lower stocks, a little bit of a higher price. Uh, the next slide is the stocks to use and just shows those uh, and see historically where the, the blue bars are, the stocks to use uh, domestically, uh, and then where prices, how prices uh, line up there with the uh, lower stocks and higher prices. This year we've seen, last few years we've seen stocks uh, uh, declining a little bit, but not, uh, not tight historically. Uh, the next slide, this is uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is just how big of an increase we've seen in wheat prices relative to corn. So we've seen that uh, spread move out from, you know, $1.40 premium uh, July uh, wheat futures versus corn, you know, up to uh, well over $2, approaching $2.20 uh, a bushel premium, uh, you know, July wheat versus corn. So uh, wheat market is uh, is uh, really performed pretty well and surging higher and maybe even trying to provide a little bit of incentive for farmers in the uh, Northern Plains to, uh, to maybe boost their spring wheat plantings a little bit. Uh, the next slide, uh, here's the wheat acreage again. So that's uh, 44.7 million you know, out of the winter wheat uh, surveyed estimate plus the uh, prospective plantings for the spring in Durham totals up to 44.7, down about 1% from a year ago, but that's actually the lowest uh, on USDA's record. It goes back to 1919. So uh, still in a major downtrend in US wheat acres. Uh, and again, here's the uh, nearby monthly uh, price chart. You can see we're up toward that upper end of the, uh, the, the range here uh, on, on the wheat market. Sort of the key, I think, uh, is $6. So you can somehow clear that on the nearby futures contract. That would be a, a pretty big positive uh, technical uh, signal uh, for wheat. Uh, the next uh, is the price chart. You can see how the uh, July futures have, have uh, moved up here. Uh, from that uh, low uh, back in March, uh, made a high just uh, just a little over 570. We pulled back, uh, kind of retested that uh, the downtrend line, and now we're uh, maybe going to try and make another run up there towards the 570. If you clear that, then you're probably looking at uh, a retest of that high at 590. Uh, so I guess to sum things up on wheat, uh, despite large global supplies in U.S. stocks, we've actually seen the wheat market perform fairly well uh, amid the COVID outbreak. Uh, and a lot of those, uh, as we talked about, with some export restrictions and a little bit of stockpiling around the world. Uh, one thing to keep our eye on here is the crop uh, prospects in Europe and uh, especially southern Russia. It's uh, uh, leaning, trending a little dryish in uh, southern Russia, so I have to keep an eye on that. Uh, maybe trying to incentivize some additional uh, spring wheat plantings up in the Northern Plains. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is uh, really uh, some improvement in the winter wheat condition ratings uh, out there. So our condition ratings will be out again this afternoon. Uh, we had the first national number last week. It was 62% uh, good to excellent, uh, which is uh, which is a decent uh, rating for, for wheat, you know, about slightly above average, I'd call it. Uh, trade is expecting a uh, number to kind of hold steady again uh, this week at that 62%. But uh, anyway, some, uh, some uh, improvement over what uh, ratings look like you know, from last fall and maybe earlier this winter. Anyway, so that does it, uh, and we'll turn to the soybeans. Um, on the soybean side, the, there is really no change in the total su supply side much from the March estimates. We really no change there. Crush is up about 20 million bushels. Exports down 50 million bushels. Exports are a place we're gonna watch and you're gonna see it on a graph here in a second, but it is an area where uh, USDA remains a bit strong and I don't know whether they've built in uh, some specific factors on the US-China uh, trade, trade phase one trade agreement, but um, it, it does look pretty aggressive given where we're at today. Um, ending stocks up, they just dumped everything into ending stocks essentially about, uh, increased about 55 million bushels. Um, and so our prices are down again um, to uh, 865. So uh, not necessarily the best of, of outlooks. Now, uh, prospective plantings, when it came out, when we look out into the 2020 uh, year, 
uh, 83.5 was essentially, million acres was essentially what, what farmers reported that going to plant in 2020. I think the market's going to bid in a few more acres into soybeans. I don't know that it's going to be great, but these numbers here might not be all that far off when the, at the end of the day. Um, and so you can see what it means for the farm prices down there at eight, looking out for 831 in, in 2020. So um, uh, maybe, maybe we'll get more optimism if something happens on the, on the side, trade side with China. So here's where we are right now. Here's our accumulated soybean exports and outstanding sales. And you can see, even compared to last year, we're still running behind. And so um, this is where I have concern. This is where I think we may, could see our demand weaken uh, some more. And if you look at where we are in terms of our sales to China, um, you can see we're sitting right where we were at last year at this time. And that's uh, supposed to be with a, with a better trade agreement. So this is, the, this is the, the concern, this area right here. You know, are we gonna see that pick up? It typically does not pick up until we get into late September when they're buying new crop or, or late August when they're starting to buy new crop for, uh, for next year, uh, from next year's crop or from this year's crop, but, but when it gets harvested. So, so that's, that's the concern. Are we going to really see anything happen there? Um, here is just another way to look at our kind of our top export destinations and you can see China being slightly weaker than, than where they were at this point last year. So this is a September 1 through April 2nd. So um, really not much gain elsewhere. Mexico is relatively steady from last year, maybe slightly weaker. The EU is down of course because the EU had a short supply of protein last year because their, uh, their rapeseed crop uh, was, was smaller. So the, uh, if we look at soybeans in competing countries then, um, the big news out of this particular release was that slightly weaker production in Argentina and Brazil than what we were expecting last month. And so in some ways that's, that's good news for US producers because it, it, it helps with uh, uh, reducing the, the total supply out there. At the same time, if you look at some of the revisions to crush in Argentina, uh, they're down 110 million bushels on crush. Uh, their, their ending stocks are up 74 million bushels. And so in their exports, they did not change. Um, but if you look at Brazil, um, their production slightly down. Crush is up 18 million bushels. Exports up 55 million bushels. So uh, in that sense, uh, actually pushing a little more competition out. So, so you can see on the one side, well, the supply was down. At the same time, they're exporting more uh, out of Brazil. So, um, and then if you look at what has happened on yields, uh, this is USDA's map of the uh, various provinces of Brazil. And you can see in general, almost with, that, with the exception of Rio Grande do Sul, that yields are up and you can see Mato Grosso's yields up 9% on here. So part of that uh, is what's contributing to uh, their overall um, uh, growth in, in, in uh, or their, their optimism with respect to yields this year. Um, if we look at the August 2020 soybean futures and I, I, I picked on August because I thought, well, you've got the, you know, for, for those who may still have crop in their bin, um, you've got to make the decision as to what you're gonna do with that. And here's, here's the difficulty. Um, we probably are past our 75th percentile opportunities. Um, and so now it's gonna be a matter of, can we get uh, a, a, good, a good price? Uh, we're probably not gonna get back up into that 935 range, but is there an opportunity for us to find, you know, an 890 or a $9, a bushel price, and if you adjust it for your local basis, you know, if it's 20 cents, then you're at 880 or, or whatever. But the, um, um, the point being that uh, this may be uh, the, uh, you know, our, our, our downside scenario where we have to take that, that out. And uh, soybeans actually a, a little better shape than corn, but, um, but that's, that's what we're looking at. And then if we start to think about new crop futures, the 75th percentile sits at 955 uh, uh, a bushel, and so all all the prices that are 
below that. There's a 75% of the price is going to be below that. But if you want to get in that top quarter, uh, the pricing opportunities don't look like we're going to get there right now. So we're going to have to keep an eye. Uh, there's probably not, a, it's not real attractive to price the crop right now. Um, we'll, we're going to have to watch and see uh, uh, if anything comes up in June or or um, if, if there's any production issues this year. So keeping an eye on that pretty closely. I uh, Not really a whole lot of signal out there right now. So all in all, um, you know, the, uh, the news was not particularly good. It's uh, soybeans in general, prices have held up better than corn. You can see that by the soybean to corn price ratio. Um, watch, watch carefully in the markets so that if you do see an opportunity, you can take advantage of it. Um, but there's not a lot out there that's providing a lot of optimism for us right this second. Um, and so we're gonna keep an eye on and see, see what China's behavior is. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and let him take you through the technical analysis. So Johnny, you handed it over to me. Yes, that's what I'm gonna to try to do. It says you have it, but uh, see if you okay. can make it move. Are you moving it or am I moving it? You're moving it. <laughs> All right. Well, let me go, hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, what I wanna do here <clears throat> for a few minutes, I see, um, I want to just sort of talk about two things, sort of combine them together and look at the technicals a little bit and talk about some strategies a little bit too. Uh, if you just look at this as the July uh, 2020 corn futures chart and about four things I always look at any kind of technicals. Number one, what is the trend? And you can pretty well see since about January. The any of the indicators, I like to look at it. There's a lot of them, I like several. Indicators. I didn't put those on there, but if you look at those, you've got that red line, which is the 10 day moving average. Hey, Dave, Dave, can you hear me? Dave, Dave, you're, we, we can't hear you, Dave. Dave, can you hear me? How about now? Yeah, now we can hear you. I didn't really do anything. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Sorry about that. Nope. Let me go back. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I apologize for that. All right, let me start all over. Uh, okay, uh, let me start all over again. Uh, keeps moving on me. We're gonna be here at three o'clock if this thing don't move, right? <laughs> I apologize, I'm, I'm not very good at this, I apologize. Okay, uh, if everybody hears me, I'm gonna keep on plowing through. Um, this is a July 2020 chart. What I'm going to try to do here very, very, very quickly now um, is look at some of the technicals and maybe a few um, maybe strategies. Uh, when I look at any kind of technicals, I try to look at the, the trend. You can see since January, the trend is down. Uh, the indicators, one of the indicators I like to look at is the moving averages. You can see the red lines, the 10 day, the blue line. I don't use it too often, the 20 that's sort of a good intermediate. And then you got the green, the 50, and the purples, the 200. And anytime you're all below those moving averages, again, that's pretty obvious in a downtrend. So again, our indicators are not showing anything very positive. The pattern is, a, is the individual over several trending days, do you sort of put together a pattern? Uh, I, I didn't mark it on here. We had several sort of bearish flag patterns on there that sort of pointed down. But here in the last week or so, we have sort of put in a series of what I call dojis, where you have a high and a low, and, but you had the open and close pretty close the same. And that speaks of in this indecision. And I'll sort of show you that again. My sound off again? Somebody sent me no sound. I, I, I can hear you, David. Okay. I don't 
Okay, maybe just bounce back. I was watching my phone here. Okay. Okay, so hear you loud and clear. All right. Um, so that may be an indicator. I know the market was down hard this morning. I think it came back and closed maybe not quite as low. I'm again, not really sure, but I think we're sort of holding that. So that, and then really until we get above that 10 day moving average there, really, I think we're showing a downtrend. So what should you do? You know, we're sort of usually December through March is usually your best time to sell old crop grain, corn and beans. We're sort of out of that. So what do I do? My suggestion is you can start at the bottom, you need to draw a line in the sand. And my line, the sands around that lows lows around 331. So if the market closes below 330, 331, sell something or sell it all, however you want to do it, or scale in some kind of selling. If we could hold this and start rallying up a little bit, maybe we get a little bullish news on the crude oil front, which is probably a big one. I know they cut crude oil a little bit, but maybe not enough. Who knows? It could be some other data information coming out. If you hit any of those moving averages, then make more sales or just sort of scale yourself up. If you look on the side there, I put a strategy, I call it calendar sales. You know, maybe just sell 10% every Wednesday for 10 weeks or 20% once a week for five weeks or, you know, 25 for four weeks. But you just got to put together some kind of strategy. Either draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to sell it or have some kind of scale and sell, something like that. You got to have some kind of strategy in place right now. Uh, hope is not a very good marketing strategy. It's good for faith, but it's not good for marketing. Um, and again, you sort of say, I'm not going to repeat things that John and, and um, Marty said they did a great job covering a lot of already some of the fundamentals. It's going to take a take some kind of major change in the happening. Most likely, I see it'll either be weather and or something in the China front coming. And of course, right now in the coronavirus, of course, with all this fear and uncertainty, is keeping people pretty on the sidelines. I'm going to move to the next one. And I'm like, again, you've seen that many times. Anytime you get futures above four bucks, 390, you probably need to be a seller. You notice right there, 330 has been hit several times. So maybe that means we're getting pretty close to a low. Sometimes you sort of build in all the bad news and then you sort of see where we go from there. There is the December corn futures, sort of the same thing. The trend is down. The indicators are all below the major indicators. Look at the pattern. I sort of circled there on that December. Look at all those dojis. Again, what I'm saying, you got a high, low, and you close, and you're open about the same. That just speaks of indecision. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going higher. It just means the market is saying, hey, I'm waiting to pick up some data and maybe move it one way or the direction. So we'll see what happens. We're up on Friday. I think we're down a little bit today, and we'll see how it goes. Again, my line in the sand is about 346. As you can see, again, sort of the same scenario, you know, either, I, I think for I think for corn right now, the new crop, I don't think I'd be as aggressive seller as it, maybe the old crop, because uh, usually that, we're in that March through 4th of July is usually key selling opportunities for new crop corn, especially when you hit the month of June. We'll see how the weather comes about. We'll see how the South America crop turns out. We still have some factors out there. Uh, and again, you can sort of see those are some, maybe some targets. I'll, I'm going to lay it up at a strategy. Hey, I'm going to be a little optimistic. Why not buy a 380 call for December for 14 cents? I'm sort of thinking about doing that myself. And then scale in some sales. And you still got that long futures position, that long call that prices do keep in higher. Or I thought of another strategy, maybe buying two of those. And then you can maybe sort of liquidate some of those as you go up and collect the money and maybe even buy a put with it later on. Usually time you, when you're trying to get, usually when the market peaks around that 4th of July into June, maybe not a bad time to buy a put or something like that. So there's a strategy there you might want to take a, take a look at. And again, same scenario, anytime you get December futures or so above the $4 level. How about beans? Um, I call maybe Again, very similar, you know, the trend is sort of down, you're sort of down below the 50 day moving average, the 200 day moving average. Uh, we've got sort of, I call it two lines in the sand, the near one's at 854, 831. Uh, I know the market was up Friday, I think it was down pretty hard uh, early this morning, it may have came back a little bit. But if you've got some old crop beans, again, I'd probably use it at 854, maybe go ahead and make some sales. And then it hits 831, blow it, may make some more sales. That'd be sort of my thoughts on that. Um, big key, fundamentally right now, the 
beans don't look nearly as bad as corn unless you have a big shift in acres. And you look to the left, I got a couple more strategies, getting that calendar strategy sales for that old crop, uh, you know, selling a percentage every week. Or, you know, maybe make some sales and buy a call. You can buy a July call for about 17 cents or maybe uh, sell some beans and buy the call or, or own the beans and have the call and just then liquidate them as you sort of go up and sort of collect the difference if you're a little more bullish. So there's a couple of strategies there. And again, we see maybe, you know, I think due to all the um, MFP um, trade 980 has been sort of the lid on beans before that is about 1085 and i'd say anything above 980 and again it's sort of like a lot of things we're back to some of these historical lows around 850. uh november sort of the same scenario a little bit uh you know your trends down indicators are sort of down below the 15 to 200. uh the patterns i where i sort of suck on the gold just sort of show you how those dojis work anytime you break from that doji it usually has a pretty strong move one way the direction or the other uh again that 860 i, I don't again sort of like new crop corn i don't know if i'd be as quite as quick to pull the trigger on selling new crop just yet we'll, we'll see um but i would probably look quicker on the old crop again line in the sand for 860 Anything back in that nines with a nine on it, probably low nines is probably a good selling for new crop. And again, I've sold the strategy. I say I buy a nine forty. I should say November call, not December call, for about twenty cents and make some sales. I think a guy probably farmer needs probably build in at least a good twenty, twenty five, thirty bucks per acre, just to maybe some marketing, especially in calls stuff like that. When you use can just sort of help you market your crop. Uh, again, sort of the same thing. Nine seventy. Uh, that's probably right now since with our trade situation, 1050 used to be our old one. And getting back to the old support levels. I, I don't know if you're interested in this or not. Maybe this one even appropriate to talk about at this time. I, I, I sort of looked at some numbers here. This is corn, southeast Missouri, nine irrigated, returns to the farmer. Um, I hope this is not too boring. I, I just looked at seven columns. What, what are some of the marketing? What are some of the marketing, but also profit opportunities? Column one is 2018. We had a pretty good corn year. I said about 175, non -irrigate, a good ground, non-irrigated price, about 371. I, I sort of took those numbers, took the USDA and sort of um, uh, updated them a little bit for Southeast Missouri conditions. You run down through the numbers, it showed returns above cost at a negative $14. But if you look at this past year, you know, if you look at it, our yield's a little bit lower, price a little bit better. We had a lot of $4 corn we could have got back last summer. Kick in about an $80 MFP payment, you can see about a $64 return. Look at the bottom line. Column three is right now where we at. Let's say we have about a 170 corn. I think I saw some 330 corn a while ago. Let's see a little better basis, it gives us 340. The Art County PLC, I'm probably on a little too high on 30. I probably should have cut those in half, said maybe 15. If I was gonna redo that table, I'd probably change those, but that's okay. Maybe a little crop insurance with price being down, we may kick in some crop insurance, but you can see right now we're sitting at a, maybe a negative $54 for corn. Then I looked at some what if strategies. Well, I mean, just what if scenarios on four, five, six, and seven. Column four, what happens if we have in a good year? 340 corn, uh, maybe a $30 or so, maybe ARC PLC payment, maybe $37. All I did thing there is add about five bushels to my yield. Column five, again, uh, 170, but let's say we get a summer rally and we can lock in some $4 corn. And again, maybe then it falls off, collect maybe an ARC PLC payment. Hey, now you're in the black, about 38 bucks or so. Column six says 170, 340, but let's kick in an $80 government payment of some sort. Now you're still back in the black, not quite as good at 26. In column seven, uh, sort of the same scenario, but a little higher. Yield. Again, it just sort of gives me an idea of where we are and sort of a profitability when we start putting together some of these some of these numbers. That's what I was trying to do here. Let's look at beans here. You know, non-irrigated beans here, uh, Southeast Missouri. Maybe I'm a little strong, but maybe 55 bushels, 868 column one. You know, a $91 MFP payment, 108. You can see it all pretty well came MFP. Column two was 2019. Again, MFP was about 80 bucks an acre. I think that was a pretty low average in Southeast Missouri. Uh, put a little Art County payment in or possibly a crop insurance payment, maybe about 75. How about this year? Uh, say 53 bushels, 850 beans, uh, 23. Looking ahead, column four, five, six, and seven. 
I said, okay, let's say we came back another good year, 55, maybe average 850 beans. Uh, again, $30 art county. Again, that may be a little high, maybe closer to 15 or 20. Again, we're still stores in the black at 40. Column five, let's say we can get some 950 beans. Maybe we get a rally this summer, 53. Now you're about $66. But look at column six and seven when you kick in that some kind of government payment, now you're over 100. Uh, you know, I, that sort of brings up what we've been talking. Are we going to see a big shift in corn acres to bean acres? Uh, now, some of that dollars are going to come no matter what crop you grow. But I, I think we could be seeing maybe two or three million acre, maybe a four million acre shift. But just some numbers that I sort of ran there and taking a look at it. Finishing up here, um, there's a stock market. You can see we've sort of closed pretty high. But let's look at the technically. We're actually trending higher right now and actually gone above that 10-day moving average, which is positive. We're still below the 50. And so, but I think I think it maybe says maybe back at March 23rd, or I think it was March 23rd, we may have put in a maybe a low. I'm gonna be a little optimistic and say we put may put in a low. Not say we couldn't retrace back half of that, but maybe we have seen the worst behind us in that aspect, but we'll sort of have to see. But we really need to get above that 50 day moving average to really get things really more of a technically more bullish. Here's the weekly chart. You sort of see, I always look at that. We we we, we shot hard below the 200 on the weekly, but look, it came right back. And that's what you look for. And now we're back over that 200 and now we're just getting above that 40 week moving average. I can look at the 40 week on them. So again, maybe a swung a few sides a little more bullish in our stock market there. Uh, and there's crude oil and you can see crude oil has just been going sideways. Not much is happening here. Uh, around that $20, $25 level, you know, they cut back, um, uh, supplies a little bit, didn't really move the dial too much, but we're still way below that 50 day moving average. But look at that big gap up there between 35 and 40. I would say that would probably be the first major um, target if, if from the technical standpoint of traders out there. And here's the weekly, same thing as yet 35. And again, we're still trading lower. So you'd still say that crude oil is still in a downtrend in that aspect, sort of maybe have gone maybe a little sideways for a little bit, but until we see something major happen, primarily a better economy, people want to drive and things like that, get out and do stuff like that. I think that may be my last slide. And there's the monthly futures. Uh, at least my chart went back to about 20 bucks, $20, and that's a support level. I think there's some that show even lower than that, but that goes back to 2001. So I think that's it for me. All right, let's see if I can hand it back off. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. I will uh, take a little bit of time here and do some livestock outlook for you. Uh, I'm going to skip some slides here to get us uh, closer to being on time. Um, as as you, everyone I think knows, it's been a tough time in the livestock uh, markets of, of late and USDA and their April WASD certainly uh, reflected uh, some downward revisions in, in uh, all livestock and, and milk prices as a result of what's been going on. Um, if you look at uh, both live cattle and barrel gill prices uh, in, in this chart, you can see that uh, USDA has trimmed about uh, seven or eight dollars off both those prices over the last, so, sorry, seven or eight dollars off the hog price and about uh, five dollars off the uh, live cattle price for 2020. Uh, there's just a ton of uncertainty uh, in, in these markets right now. Um, and, and so um, I, I continue to say we've got some processing issues here in the very short run that uh, certainly uh, could make things a lot tougher. Uh, if you look at where we are in terms of uh, futures markets today, we've been pretty much locked down the limit again today as uh, uh, some of the latest plant closing news continues to, to make its way through the marketplace. Um, if, if you look at uh, USDA's quarterly price projections for April. Now I wanna, I wanna make the point that <clears throat> there might be a silver lining here uh, longer term. Uh, 
uh, we certainly have to survive what I view as the next few weeks of a pretty tough period of time as uh, you can see USDA's own estimates of uh, prices here in the second quarter are pretty tough, but uh, some rebound maybe late in the year if the economy turns around in this country uh, as we come out of the worst of the stay-at-home uh, restrictions that we've seen in place, uh, coupled with what could be some uh, strong international demand continuing for both beef and pork. Uh, Asia generally, but China, Japan, South Korea, all important in those markets. So as, as much as uh, things can be tough here in the very short run, um, I, I do see some optimism still setting out there uh, longer term. Uh, milk has been a very tough uh, situation as well. We've seen lots of uh, stories of, of milk being dumped, USDA, lowered their estimate for calendar year uh, 2020 all milk prices to about 1435 after being at uh, about 1830 the, in the March WASD. So you see the, the, the large declines. Uh, again, I remind us that uh, we've got a lot of things going on in these markets. Um, trying to balance all of this is, is certainly tough. I'm gonna use the, uh, and again, even in milk, you know, USDA may say second and third quarter are the toughest and we can get some turnaround uh, later in the year. Whoops, get to the right place here. So uh, I, I wanna remind you that we've had multiple things going on here. So, so number one, we've had a large shift from uh, what was a food service driven uh, meat industry to one that's a, a grocery store driven industry here in the short run. Uh, I've heard a lot of folks talk about uh, you know, what's happened with the food service shutdown. I'll take bacon uh, and, and bellies on this line as a good discussion point for a minute. So most of the bacon that moves from uh, processors to the food service side comes in 15 pound packs. Now that's what I order on a regular basis, uh, but most of us at the grocery store buy a single pound at a time. Um, and, and so it's not even that it's so much the, the, the change in the packaging matters, but that food service line was dedicated to producing 15 pound packs of bacon. They don't really have an option or a line to sit there and shift and say, we're gonna all of a sudden make pound packages of bacon. And so that's why we've seen some of the, the, the stories about things like uh, bellies going to rendering. Uh, it's, it's been that loss of food service side uh, but by the way, if you paid any attention to belly prices this morning, up about 20, uh, 20 cents a pound. So some pretty strong recovery all of a sudden happening on, on the belly side. At the same time, maybe those products that have been tougher uh, previous to COVID-19, I used to talk a lot about what's it take to get loin prices above a dollar. And I wish I'd never said that out loud had I known it was COVID-19. Uh, that would cause loin prices to go back above a dollar. I would have uh, been very quiet about uh, saying that out loud. So we've seen quite a switch. And I just remind you, what happens when we get rid of some of the uh, stay at home restrictions that are in place today? I think we could get some frankly strong short run uh, demand to refill those channels that are sitting there pretty empty right now. Uh, that may not last forever, but uh, we, we could get some strong pull when, when that time comes. So this is the one side of the equation. Uh, I'll say the other side of this equation right now is just how many plants stay operational. Uh, I've seen some estimates out there now that suggest 20 to 25% of capacity in the beef and pork side could be shuttered or slowed down uh, as a result of uh, workers becoming sick with COVID-19. Um, if, if that happens, that's a very tough situation for these industries. Uh, I sometimes say you can look at some of the current data and, and uh, get a little sense of what's going on. Peter Pig's last uh, Friday's uh, USDA report suggested early weaned pigs will bring anywhere from a dollar a pig to $16. I've heard some reports of uh, pigs not having a home. Uh, and, and maybe being euthanized. You know, those situations happening just remind you that the supply side is really full right now. 
Um, and, and so plants staying open is gonna be really critical uh, to where we move going forward. Just as we talked about earlier, I, I, if you look at futures markets for a minute, again, we're down the limit today, uh, but the December contract's been trading at a premium relative to the May contract in hogs. This is back to the scenario of, I think in the short run, it's really tough as plants try to deal with COVID-19 outbreaks and rent a full uh, stay at home kind of uh, environment that it gets better as we get later in the year. Uh, similar for, for cattle. Um, you know, we've got some fairly uh, low June futures prices uh, for live cattle that don't work very well, uh, yet most suggest we'll get some bounce uh, as, as we uh, get later in, in the year. Trade does look positive. You look at weekly pork shipments to China, they've continued to be uh, much, much higher than we've seen for a while. I think, uh, again, that could be something that helps us pull higher once we get beyond kind of the current issues we face uh, in, in the hog industry. And, and frankly, at times could uh, make me a little more bullish about uh, where we get late in the year. In fact, more bullish than markets or WASD or others might suggest right now. Uh, so, so we'll have to wait and see. I think just here in the short term, we're going to be trading on the day-to-day -day news about uh, which plants are open, uh, which ones are not. I'll, I'll say don't think this isn't on the radar screen of USDA in terms of plant openings and how to hand or plant closings, I should say, and how to ha handle that situation. Um, we'll just have to wait and see how all of this unfolds as we go forward. John, back to you. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh... Lots of things going on out there right now. The um, lots of uncertainty. I know we we haven't given you any exact prescriptions, and we can't do that. But but uh, um, there, you know, keep an eye on things, and there may be some opportunities. Um, as you know, we do these every month, uh, a couple of days uh, after the WASI report is released, and so. Um, if folks want to, we'll still take a few questions here. I know we're 12 minutes over now, but if anyone has a burning question, please uh, uh, go ahead and ask. 